talking about life-changing experiences, a friend of mine got on an airplane to go from D.C. to Las Vegas. And across the aisle from him was this man and his little girl, his daughter. Uh, and halfway through the flight, the man started to have a heart attack. He fell out into the aisle. And, uh, and they had to divert the plane. They landed somewhere else. And paramedics came on the plane in front of his little girl. She must have been nine, ten years old. They're trying to resuscitate this man, her dad. They put him in a body bag and pulled him off the plane. And then the plane took off with the little girl sitting next to an empty seat where her father used to sit, all the way to Las Vegas where her mother met her. Now you imagine if you were that little child, how does that turn your world upside down? How do you feel? Everything's great, and the next second, it's all over. How do you feel? How lonely, how alone, how horrible? And if you're the parent, and let's say you're the parent, and you know something like this might happen or is about to happen, would you have done something differently leading up to that moment? I see some heads nodding. What would you have done differently five years prior, 10 years prior, Knowing that you're going to put your little girl through that experience, what would you do differently? Would you maybe eat healthier? Would you maybe exercise? Yeah, I get. I, my guess is you would do a lot of things differently, and you'd be much more concerned about your health because does our health affect people we care about and we love? And if we suffer, who else suffers? Our families, our loved ones. So is health important? Who says it's important? Who says it's valuable? Who says it's worth our time, energy, effort, resources? This is something we all agree on. But then if I ask you, what do you base your health on? That's where we have maybe disagreements. You see, I used to believe that if I am pain-free, I'm healthy. That if I look good and feel good, I'm healthy. Am I healthy? You don't know exactly. Not necessarily, right? What are the top killers right now? What are people dying from? Heart disease. Is there any pain in the early stages of heart disease? Do we feel it? Do we know it? Is there any warning signs? What's the first sign of heart disease? A heart attack. Yeah. That's when part of the heart is starting to die. And a stroke, does that warn you? Do you know? Does something knock on your door and say in two years you might have a stroke? We don't know unless we go and get checked, but typically we don't know. And what about early stages of cancer? Any warnings? Is it possible someone we know and care about could have a tumor growing inside of them right now and they don't know it? Well, that's kind of scary. But if we judge our health based on how we look and how we feel, we're going to miss it. Would you agree? So maybe we need a new definition of health. Because if we define our health by our symptoms, we are healthy until we are desperately sick in a bad way. And we won't go get looked at or checked until it's possibly, potentially too late. What are our options when it's too late? What are our options before it's too late? What are our options when we're sick? We're diagnosed with something. What are our options? Option number one, everybody has this option. Do nothing about it. Is that a good option or a bad? Everybody agree, a bad option? Yeah, you know, you might say, and I, I've said this in the past, tell me if you've said this, I thought it would go away. Oh, yeah. I, probably the most dangerous sentence you've ever spoken. What if there's a leak in the ceiling, and I'll look at that leak, and I say, ah, uh, it'll go away. I think it'll go away. When it stops raining, it'll go away. But one of these days, the ceiling will cave in on my head. That's disease. That's sickness. When the ceiling caves in. So option one is do nothing about it. What's option two? Go to the other end of the spectrum, surgery. Can I assume all of us would love to avoid surgery? <laughs> Absolutely. But how often do you hear something like this where a doctor says, hey, it's not that bad yet. Wait till it gets worse, we'll operate. What if I don't want it to get worse? What do you do then? Is that a good option? Just wait till it gets worse and then operate? That's so invasive, so dangerous. 
So what's our third option? We get sick, we don't want to have the surgery. What do we do? Medication. Medication, very good. Medication. And what do most medications do? Hide the symptoms. You know the symptoms are warning signs? They're telling you that something is wrong. Well, what do we do? We take the pill and we keep going. Let me ask you, if the oil light on your car comes on on the way home tonight, how many of you will take a piece of duct tape, cover it up, keep driving? <laughs> of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. Now let me ask you this, when you cover it up, is the problem gone or is it still there? It's still there. It's still there. Which is why if you're on blood pressure medication, doctor says don't ever stop taking it. Because it's covering up the symptom and the minute you stop taking it, your blood pressure will shoot up again. In fact, it'll probably shoot up higher than it was before because the catecholamines are building up. The load, the allostatic load that was causing your body to respond with higher blood pressure, that's still there. And how your body's responding to it is by raising your blood pressure so we can suppress it with medication. But the problem is what? Gone or still there? There you go. And who wants to be imprisoned by a bag of drugs that you have to carry around with you and make sure you pack when you go on vacation that you can never stop taking? So we need a new definition. Would you agree? We need a new definition of health. What is that new definition of health? If it's not pain-free, how about if we call it function? Does that sound all right? Think about this. Health is equal to function. Meaning my immune system is function. My cardiovascular system is function. My digestive system is function. My musculoskeletal system, functioning. And all those systems are functioning in cooperation with each other, monitored and controlled by what? Would you agree? Brain? Absolutely. Does the brain control every function in your body? Absolutely 100%. You have 70 trillion cells in your body. Every single one of them receives a mental impulse from your brain. Your body's programmed to self-heal, self-regulate. Have you noticed your stomach produces acid when you need it, but not when you don't? Certain hormones fluctuate up and down based on your circumstances. And you know your red blood cells are brand new every four months. You have brand new red blood cells every four months. You have a brand new liver every 24 days. Who knew that? Every 24 days, the cells in your liver only live 24 days. They die and get replaced with new ones. You have brand new skin every 30 days. In fact, that 98% of the dust in your home is you, is your skin. We're all very dusty people. And, but my point is your skin regenerates every 30 days. And your taste buds are brand new every eight days. How amazing is that? How many of you have uh, sipped some hot coffee and burned your tongue? Within an hour, it's gone, it heals. What else heals that fast? There's one more thing that heals faster than that, it's the lining of your stomach. Every four and a half days, it's brand new. See, everything runs on a program. Those programs are all written here in the brain. And your brain controls what happens in your body. So the question is, if I chop off my head, will I live or die? <laughs> you were so quick to answer me. That's great. Is that a theory or a fact? So we don't need to do a live demonstration. Now what if I cut the nerve to my heart? Will that heart function perfectly and properly? It won't. And if I cut the nerve to any other organ, will those organs function properly? Now what if there was a dimmer? And in fact, we didn't cut the nerve, but we put a dimmer switch on it. And all we did was dim the flow of life flow of information from the brain to that organ. Will that organ be healthy or get sick? Is that a theory or a fact? Absolutely. Absolutely a fact. So if that dimmer is on the nerve to the heart and it's not receiving all the information but just some of the information, how many of you have been through a drive-through at a fast? Don't tell me. 
because I know none of you eat fast food here. <laughs> They're out there. But if you ever do, you pull up to a thing, like a box, and you place your order, they read it back to you, and what it all you hear is five signs of the window. <laughs> you don't get all the information, so what do you do? I wonder if they got my order right. I wonder if I'm supposed to go to the first window or the second window. How much is my food? And you have to guess. And what if that organ right there, that part is guessing, and now, now, the beat is irregular. Now it's not responding normally. And all of a sudden, when there's no need for higher blood pressure, you have high blood pressure. Now when there's no need for a normally low blood pressure, all of a sudden your blood pressure drops too low. Now you get dizzy when you stand up too quickly. Now, if it's on the nerve, those dimmers, if it's on the nerve to the lungs, asthma, suppressed immune system, recurrent bronchitis. And what if it's on the nerve to the stomach, heartburn, acid reflux, and indigestion? What if it's on the nerve to the liver, suppressed level of energy, high cholesterol levels, abnormal enzymes in the body, poor digestion? What if it's on the nerve to the intestines, constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis? What if it's on the nerve to the bladder, incontinence, bedwetting in children, overactive bladder, and if it's on the nerve to the reproductive organs, infertility. How important is it to make sure that those nerves don't have interference on them? Crucial, vital. So those dimmers we talked about, they're called subluxations. And subluxation, by definition, is suppression of the life that flows from the brain to the different body parts. If, if you believe that a misalignment in the spine will not affect the nervous system, it's the same as believing you can't drop a rock in a pond of water and not get ripples that go all the way out to the end. Not possible. Every misalignment affects the function of the nervous system to varying degrees. So let's talk about that subluxation, that cause. See, we talk about disease and then the cause of disease. Is it possible that two people will get exposed to the flu virus and only one of them will actually get sick? Is that possible? Yeah. Is that because the other one had a stronger immune system? Must be. The virus was the same. And so the one who has a stronger immune system is probably less likely to get cancer. Why do I say that? Because your immune system is designed to seek out cancer cells, destroy them, and excrete them. How important is it to make sure the function of your immune system is excellent? What do we say controls function? Brain. Connected by nerves to everything in your body. Does that certainly make sense? So, how many of you know what a tooth cavity is? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so, so is it possible that someone could have a tooth cavity and not know it? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, someone could have a subluxation in their spine. They're silent by definition, and you have to lose sixty to ninety percent of the function of an organ before you have a symptom. And none of these organs actually have pain receptors on them. Your pain receptors are in your joints, your skin your muscle, but you don't have pain receptors on your heart. That's why the most severe heart attack, you get tightness in the chest. Not a lot of pain. Tissues are dying un underneath, and the person doesn't feel a whole lot of pain. Yeah, ch chest tightness and sweating, difficulty breathing, but that's end stage. So we can't wait, right? So number one, you don't necessarily feel it. Number two, if you leave a tooth cavity alone, will it stay the same? Will it get better by itself, or will it get worse? Yes. Get worse. Same thing with the subluxation; it will deteriorate to the point where the discs will bulge, bone spurs will form, and the spine will start to fuse. At that point, we have permanent nerve damage. And who's susceptible to having tooth cavities? If you have what? Teeth. Very good. You don't get three sets of teeth. You have your baby teeth, your permanent teeth, your false teeth. So, so how many sets of vertebrae do you get in your spine? Just one. That's it. Only one. So, so should we take care of this? 
So, no, absolutely, very good. Number four, uh, what if a dentist tells me that I have a cavity somewhere in my mouth, obviously. And I tell this dentist, don't worry about it because I'm on my way to the gym. I'm gonna go exercise. I'm gonna lift a bunch of weights and then I'm gonna go home and eat a big bowl of broccoli and then I'm gonna sleep. I'm gonna sleep at least eight hours and I'm gonna do that every night and every day and I'm just gonna change my life. I'm gonna live extremely healthy. Are any of those things going to fix that tooth cavity? Are you sure? How do you know? It's just a fact. And if my spine is misaligned and it needs to look like this, but it's like this. Can I get an injection of some chemical and have that go in there and realign my spine? Can I take a pill and have it go and realign my spine? Can I eat a bunch of broccoli and have it go and realign my spine? Absolutely not. That's absolutely What is the only way to correct the tooth cavity? And who is the only person who can correct the tooth cavity? Not the barber. Or the gardener? No. Dentist. And who's the only person who can correct a subluxation? Actually, just Dr. Nicole, Dr. Roberto, and myself, that's it. <laughs> For your purposes, that's all you have. Yeah, you're correct. A chiropractor. A chiropractor is who will be able to detect and correct a subluxation. And incidentally, what's more important, detecting or correcting it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, you need to know where it is and you need to know what it looks like, right? So how does a dentist know exactly where that cavity is? X-ray. X-ray. Is there any other way? Anything else is guessing. Yeah. But how do you know, even by touch, even if you're 90% sure, can you be 100% certain that that cavity is angled a certain way, shaped a certain way, has a certain depth, can you be sure without x-ray? No. Well, same with this. The only way to find the misalignment is by x-ray. And when's the best time to correct the tooth cavity? Immediately. At the beginning. Very good. The sooner the... And what about a subluxation in the spine? That one we can wait, right? Let it, let it go, uh, and, uh, and if the uh, organs start to fail then, Let's get it looked at. Let's wait till we are slumped over and we can't straighten up, and then let's let it looked at. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Absolutely. Let me ask you, does this make sense? Charlie won't go home. Does this make sense? Is it logical? So if you're anything like me, by now, you're thinking, then why haven't I heard about it before? Now why didn't my uh, primary care physician tell me the same exact thing you're telling me? Why don't they teach this in schools? I mean, it makes sense, and especially, you know, you can see it, right? In fact, Grey's Anatomy is the first textbook you get in medical school. First page says the nervous system is the master system in charge of all the functions of the body. But see, in medical school, chiropractic school, you turn a page, you start studying the heart, and then you turn a page and study the lungs and the liver and the kidneys, and you move on. But that first page is the most important thing, which is the nervous system and the brain and how everything else works. So why haven't we heard about this before? Why isn't this common knowledge? Why doesn't everybody just say, yeah, I get my teeth checked twice a year by the dentist, and I get my spine checked twice a year by the chiropractor, and that's just normal, and if you don't do it, you're not normal. Why is that the case? <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of good answers. Listen, anything that's common knowledge takes a long time to become common knowledge. In the mid 1500s, there was this guy named Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus. What did he say? That the Earth is not the center of the universe, it's not flat, that it actually revolves around the sun. And what did the religious leaders do? They condemn them of, uh, or they, they accuse them of heresy, call him a heretic. They couldn't actually put him in prison yet because he died that year. He lucked out. And I wonder if he had some vexations. 
Then there was this guy named Galileo in the mid 1600s, right? What did he say? He invented the telescope. He said, just look in here. Just, just come look. The earth is revolving around the sun. Is that coming to us, by the way? And today, back then, people would whisper, hey, I'm one of those people who believes the earth is not the center. I'm one of those weirdos. I'm an anarchist. That's what they used to say. And guess what? Galileo, he was put in prison. They said, recant or we'll kill you. So he recanted. He said, never mind. The earth is the center of the world. And then they put him under house arrest. And that's where he lived and died the rest of his years. Common knowledge. In the 1840s, Dr. Ignaz uh, Philip Semmelweis. I practiced that name so many times. <laughs> and I won't say it again. <laughs> was an obstetrician. He wrote an article based on research he did, he conducted. And the article made so much controversy in the medical community that they had him committed to a mental asylum. And he died in that mental asylum at the young age of 47. You wanna know what that article said? He said, if you wash your hands before you deliver a baby, and after you deliver a baby, before you deliver the next baby, the babies don't get sick, they don't die. Wow. Obviously, he was crazy, right? <laughs> did he have proof? Galileo had the telescope, what did he have, right? Infant mortality rate at the time was over 18%. In his office, it was nearly 1%. 1%. 18% of kids were dying of infections after birth. Only 1% in his office were dying. Proof. But when did that become common knowledge? Now we don't even eat without washing our hands. Hope you all washed your hands. <laughs> and you know, in 1920, there was a, at the University of Pennsylvania, there was a doctor named Henry Windsor. Henry Windsor asked a very important question. He said, how is it that these chiropractors are getting people better without drugs and surgery? Because I really didn't think there was any other way to get people better. Drugs and surgery is it. How are they getting better? So he got permission from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and he, he did dissections. These dissections became famously known as the Windsor autopsies. And he dissected 75 humans and 22 cats. I don't know why cats, but he found 121 diseased organs in these dissections. Nearly 100% of the diseased organ had a correlation with the spinal abnormality at the same level of where the nerve went to that organ. So I'll read you the results of his study. He discovered that all 20 cases of heart and pericardium conditions had the upper thoracic vertebrae misaligned. This area where the nerves go to the heart. Lung disease, all 26 cases of lung disease had spinal misalignments in the upper thoracic region, same area. Stomach disease, all nine cases of spinal misalignments in the mid thoracic region, T5 to 9, right here, had stomach disease. <coughs> liver disease, all 13 cases of liver disease had misalignments in the mid thoracic region, T5 to T9. Gallstones, all five cases of gallstone disease had spinal misalignments in the mid thoracic region. Pancreas, all three cases of pancreas disease had spinal misalignments, mid thoracic. Spleen, all 11 cases of spleen. You get the idea. There was kidney disease, there was prostate and bladder disease, there was uterine disease or uterus problems. So you look at all of that, nearly 100% correlation between the organ that was diseased and the segment of the spine that was misaligned. So now today, now that, that is still not common knowledge. Why? because it took the church 300 years before they actually cleared Galileo's name, 300 years. In the 1900s is when the church apologized to his grave, saying, okay, you're not a heretic anymore. 300 years, chiropractic's been around for 125 years. And the Windsor autopsies were in 1920, published in Medical Times in 1921. So today, the medical community is largely ignoring the findings for that very reason. Because it sounds like it's crazy. And guess what? I don't mind if anyone tells me I'm crazy. Because you want to know what gets me so fired up and so excited is you guys. And the stories that we hear. 
Um, we had little Alan who uh, has asthma, and every time he gets a respiratory infection, his lungs fill with fluid, and he has to go to the hospital and nearly dies. It had happened twice. The third time, the parents knew about us. They brought him in. We got him adjusted. It was late. They were stuck in traffic. They were about to go to the urgent care. They said to come get adjusted first. Well, anyways, I said, bring him back first thing in the morning. The next day, 8 a.m., they're not there. Thinking, oh, no, they're probably in the hospital. They probably spent the night in the hospital. 10 a.m., they roll in. Alan's not in the um, stroller. He's actually running. He ran over, jumped on the table, got ready for his next adjustment. His color looks fine. Where the night before, dark eyes, lethargic, could hardly breathe. Mom said, I didn't want to wake him up because for the first time, he wasn't snoring through the night and he slept in and I wanted him to rest. That's why we didn't come first thing in the morning. What's that worth? We see people overcome infertility and migraine headaches. Uh, we see people drop and throw away their blood pressure medication on a regular basis. There was a man who wanted to show his son where her ancestors came from. So he put his son in the car that drove towards the mountains and they, they, when they rode ended, they got on mules. They rode these mules around the side of the mountain until they came to this valley where there was this beautiful village and a, and a, and a river. And uh, imagine going back in time, just the most beautiful scene. No power lines, no plumbing, uh, no motorized vehicles, people in traditional clothing. And while this father and son were there in this village, a woman went into labor and she's in tremendous amount of pain. People went into the house, see what was going on. And, uh, and a midwife came in and knelt down and examined her for a few minutes, stood up, said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. There's no heartbeat. She's not going to make it. And she left. And his father and son were looking in the eyes of this young woman who was just told she's not going to live another few hours. And a little boy started to have this panic attack. You ever see nine-year-olds cry? They're just trying to catch his breath. The chest feels really tight. And tears coming down. The throat feels all choked up. And uh, his father picked him up and held him, carried him out of there. They climbed down the mountain, got in the car to go home. On the drive home, the little boy said, Dad, I don't want to feel like that ever again. Like what? You know, helpless. What are you going to do about it? He said, I'm going to go become a surgeon, the best surgeon in the whole world. I'm going to carry my medical bag with me. Everywhere I go, I'm going to save lives. So that doesn't happen in front of me ever again. Ten years later, he was a student in college, getting ready for medical school. He went home for Christmas break. His dad had this big, thick, white neck brace on. He couldn't move his arms to give his son a hug because he was limp and numb from the shoulders down. And he's done tr under a tremendous amount of pain, under heavy painkillers. And they spent that Christmas break, father and son, again, going doctor to doctor, trying to figure out what is wrong with dad. And every doctor they go to says, you need to go to this other doctor. Finally, they end up in a neurosurgeon's office. The neurosurgeon said, you needed surgery yesterday. What are you waiting for? What was that five dangerous word sentence? Do you guys remember? Thought it would go away. That's what he said. I thought it'd go away. Doctor said, we need to slice you open in the back of the neck. We're going to break and remove the bones in the back of your spine to take pressure off the spinal cord. We're going to put these rods in. We're going to screw them into your spine. We'll lose your whole neck. You'll never turn your head again. You may not regain function of your hands, but we're hoping you have less pain. And there's a chance you're going to die because you're old. The man was 70. But would you agree there's such thing as a young 70 and an old 70? Yeah, he was the old 70. And so they got a second and a third opinion, and all three neurosurgeons agreed that this man needed surgery. They scheduled it. Father and son got in a taxi to go home. And his son's carrying all the x-rays in the back of the taxi. He looked over at his dad. And his dad was cringing because every bump that taxi hit was sending a lightning bolt of pain through his entire body. He actually wished he was dead right there and then. And the son remembered the village where he witnessed the woman die in her husband's arms and there was nothing anybody could do. And he's feeling helpless all over again. The same feeling he swore he'd never feel again. Well, his taxi driver looked at them in the rear view mirror and said, hey, I know you're in a lot of pain. And I know you asked me to take home, take you home. But there's this chiropractor right down the street. Why don't you let me take you there? Long story short, they ended up in the chiropractor's office. The chiropractor looked at those MRIs and x-rays and CTs and, and said, listen, if you want to have surgery, go ahead. But if you don't want to have this operation, this is your alternative. We're going to take pressure off the nerves and turn on your body's self-healing, self-regulating mechanism. He said, I won't lie to you, it's going to be long, hard, long and hard, painful road ahead. But if you don't want to have surgery, this is your alternative. What do you want to do? 
when he made a commitment, he went, he, you know, he went there practically every day for six months. In fact, after a couple months, he wasn't any better. After like two, three months, he wasn't any better. But he noticed he had stopped getting worse. In fact, everybody around him said, you stopped getting worse. He says, all right, let's keep going. Six and a half months later, he walked in that office, walked up to the counter, he picked up the pen with his own hand, and he signed his name on the sign-in sheet. Remember, he couldn't use his hand before. He was so proud of himself that day, he held the pen like this. And he started pacing back and forth in that reception area where everybody else was sitting. This was a busy office. Every chair was filled full of a patient, you know, patients all around. They're all smiling at him. But that receptionist behind the counter, she started crying. Because every time this man walked in, she had to write his name. And when he'd get a feeling, little feeling in his hand, he'd try to write, she would hold his hand, try to help him, but he'd drop the pen. He just gets so frustrated. But that day and every day after that, he was able to write. He was able to use his hands. He was able to dress himself, feed himself, take care of himself. That man lived to be 88 years old. And, and you may not believe this, but at 88, he was younger than when he was 70. At 88, he was younger than when he was. How would you like to be younger at 88 than you are today? He would get up and exercise every morning. He'd go out the door, go visit his friends. They're all in nursing homes, but not him. Living a good life and enjoying it. His son is standing in front of you right now. See, Dad lived long enough to stand right here, right next to me when I got married. My best man. Dad lived long enough to hold my first son when he was born. So why do I get passionate about chiropractic? That's exactly why. Because I've seen it firsthand. I see it every day in our office. Now listen, uh, if you've never had your nervous system evaluated, there's no worse thing to do than to wait. So you need to get your spine checked. Someone invited you here. Do you know why my dad lived that long and why he lived the life that he did and he enjoyed it? It's because some taxi driver 23 years ago looked at us in the rear view mirror and, and said something. For those of you who are guests, someone talked to you and said something. He said, come, hear this. What you do with it is yours. But you never know what one thing you do or say will change the lives of millions moving forward. When you come to our office, your initial evaluation includes your health history. We'll sit with you with one of the doctors. You're going to sit down and talk to us. We're going to do a thorough physical evaluation, including functional neurology. Those, are, those who are patients will tell you. We'll make you touch your nose and walk in the line and, and do backflips and everything else. Uh, and it's okay, don't worry. And, uh, and we take a specialized set of x-rays of the spine, and we do a computerized, computerized analysis of the nerves of your spine and make sure every nerve is working properly. Now, you, you think about that, a physical exam that thorough with that much computerized analysis in the x-rays, how much would that cost in a hospital? Can we give you a round of applause? Can we thank them? Applaud yourself. <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for your family and those you care about and those who care about you. See, when my dad was sick, was he the only one suffering? Who else suffered? And if I love my three sons and my wife, what should I do with my health? Take care of it. And do it for them, not for me. Right? So because you're here, because you were invited by one of our beloved patients, because I won't have to repeat some of the information that I shared with you already, we're able to reduce the 329 all the way down to 97. So if you're writing notes, cross off the 329, write $97. If you schedule that appointment within the next two weeks, we can reduce it to 97. And because we believe that families who get healthy together stay together, that applies to your family. So what that means is an immediate family member is only $20 more. So, so $97 for you, $20 for your spouse. If you want to have your children checked, $20 for each child. And we'll get everybody checked and evaluated and find out. Because subluxations don't wait. Diseases don't wait. And if we wait till an organ is diseased before we check the alignment of that spine, are we doing a good thing? Your food's about to come out. And when it does, our team members are going to come to your table and help you schedule your appointments, help you make your payments, and they'll answer all your questions. I just have one last thing to tell you. That is, I have a vision for you. The vision is that if you make this commitment, that you decide to take care of your spine and your nervous system, 
you'll never be like the people out there. Walking around saying, I'm too old for this or I'm too old for that. That you'll live 90, 100, 120 years of full, energetic, vibrant life, enjoying your life with mental clarity to enjoy and make memories and build memories with your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Do the things you want to do for as long as you want to. In fact, those people are falling apart. They're coming to you asking you, how is it you're staying so vibrant and healthy and, and energized and we're all falling apart, you're keeping it together. And that is when you'll say, I went to this dinner. I heard the story about a taxi driver. I made a choice. I made a commitment. It was worth it. You're worth it. Enjoy your dinner. I'll see you at the office.